already. Note that the <coughs> forum is being recorded and will be available for viewing on our YouTube channel, School SD Holman. With five candidates in the running for only two available seats on the school board, a primary election will be held on Tuesday, February 16th. Voters will be instructed to vote for not more than two candidates. The four candidates with the highest number of votes will move on to the April 5th spring election ballot. For those in the audience, we encourage your participation in tonight's forum by submitting questions using the note cards on your tables. You may forward your questions to Christina Kovacs. Christina, if you want to wave. She will, if you raise it up, she will come around and find you and then um, she will pass them on to the moderator for consideration. We thank the League of Women Voters members who have generously committed their time each year and ask for their assistance in holding a forum. We welcome and thank Maureen Kinney, attorney with Johns, Flaherty and Collins, who serves as the moderator this evening, and Mary Nugent, a longtime teacher in our district who is now retired, who will serve as the timekeeper. At this time, I will introduce the candidates in the order that they will appear on the ballot. Lisa Cozen, if you just want to raise your hand. Lisa Collins, Thomas Lyons, Rick Hayden, and Rebecca Reber. And so now I'll turn it over to Maureen um, for the rest of the proceedings. Okay, and so at this point, each of you are going to give a two minute opening to say whatever you want about yourself while you're running your background. And we will start with Lisa Collins. I think you can go ahead. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. My name is Lisa Collins, and um, I'm currently serving on the Holman School District um, Board of Education, and I'm the treasurer. And I am wanting to run again um, for my second term. Can't believe three years has gone by, but um, my second term here um, for Holman because I can't believe what a wonderful district we have. I, I, you know, the reputation out in the community is a pretty amazing. Um, even before I had gotten on the board this last time, um, but now working behind the scenes and working with leadership very closely, um, getting to know the teachers and the staff and talking with students and parents, um, I really believe it's true. I want to continue to serve I think that three years has been just a taste of um, what I need to know to be able to be um, well versed in the district and to be an advocate for students and um, staff and the community. I'm a social worker um, for La Crosse County Human Services and I've been there for 18 years. Um, I work in the foster care arena and have been in Child Protective Services um, through Human Services the majority of my time at the department. And it's always been my drive to um, contribute and be part of a community and I would say my strongest strengths are developing relationships and learning about how we can work better together as a community um, for the most important thing here in our community, which is the education of our young people. So thank you. Rick? Hi, my name is Rick Hyden. Uh, I'm 46 years old. I've lived in uh, Holman for 22 years, and I have two kids that have gone through the school district system, um, and my wife is a photography uh, a photographer in the area, Jamie. Uh, some of you may have heard of them. They're more famous than I am. <laughs> so I appreciate you coming out tonight to uh, see if uh, who will serve the district uh, in a way that uh, fits the nature of the district's excellence, um, which is one of the reasons that my family and I moved here 22 years ago. We were selecting places to, uh, to reside. Um, our prime, one of our primary reasons for settling in Holman um, was what we had heard about the district. We had heard about uh, the cohesiveness of it, the caring of it, the uh, intention decisions that were made, 
which was very impressive. So after 22 years and uh, seeing both of our children come through the district and the various schools within the district, we've been very pleased. Whether it be how the district handled my wife's, well, our concern with how lice was handled in the elementary school districts, uh, to the um, welcoming of the use of the school district facilities for maybe things that weren't so normal, like a, a first Lego league kind of thing that we've gotten involved with, uh, our 4-H involvement, um, and other things that we've uh, uh, divided our time amongst uh, work and, uh, and uh, um, serving. So my primary reason for, for running is to continue to serve the district at a point where I have more time now, given the kids are, are raised and out of the house. Lisa. Good evening. My name is Lisa Cozen. I have been a resident of Holman and the school district for almost 10 years. Um, I am married with four children. All four are currently in the school district. Uh, one is a senior. I have two sophomores, and then I have a third grader at Viking School as well. I do have a bachelor's degree in business management from Quincy University in Quincy. Uh, we originally had moved up here from, uh, from Bloomington, Illinois, and part of the reason for moving to Holman was uh, it was between Holman and Onalaska, and we, we chose Holman uh, mostly for um, not just the school district, but for the hominess, the friendliness of the people we found here. I currently work for the L.B. White Company in Onalaska. I am the human resources manager there. Uh, we deal a lot with personnel issues, uh, similar to my time serving on the uh, board committee, the personnel and governance committee since 2013. Uh, we deal with uh, employee handbooks, that type of thing. So I've been involved uh, with the school board uh, in that length of time. Um, one of the reasons I am running for the school board is uh, the, the growth possibility. I'm, I'm just down the street from us. There's a brand new subdivision. It's not planted out yet. It's got the streets, but I see there's going to be homes coming up there. Um, and the school, is the school district will have to adjust to that and have to start to uh, plan for that. And I'm excited to be part of that as the, the district grows bigger and bigger. Uh, another reason that I am, I am running is because I'm, I'm concerned about the kids and I want to make sure that their school uh, experience is the best that it can be. And I think we found that in the Holman School District. Uh, last week we were at uh, a meeting, uh, the school board meeting, and uh, there was a presentation on the scores. Uh, on Alaska did better in the high school level than Holman did, um, and I'd like to see if we can try to turn that around. Thank you. Thomas? Good evening. At least we're doing this ahead of the snowstorm. <laughs> Uh, just like a few comments, uh, my wife and I moved our family to the Cooley region in 1975. We took up residence on the other side of the river. If, if that's not a sin around here, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> uh, we lived in La Crescent for, uh, for 25 years until we moved to Holman in uh, 2000 and uh, found a nice piece of land just east of town and have enjoyed, enjoyed our, our stay there. While in La Crescent, I had the ability or the good fortune to serve on the school board in La Crescent for six years. In that time, uh, we went through all the trials and tribulations of every school district. I also served on the uh, board for the La Crescent Hoka Education Foundation. Uh, the thing that brought me to La Crosse and, uh, in the first place was the uh, opportunity for employment uh, with the, an architectural firm. I'm a registered architect, and uh, since uh, the last 20 years now, I've been self-employed. Uh, the majority of my uh, work right now has been multifamily housing. The last three, four major housing projects in Holman here have been under my direction. So. Uh, the, uh, my, actually, the reason for running is I, I think I bring some experiences uh, in the architectural field where we worked with school districts over the, over the years. And uh, that plus my school board experience and what have you, I think I bring some of the experiences that I need to help make decisions and keep the Holman School District moving in the direction that it's been going. Thank you. Rebecca. 
Hi, I'm Rebecca Reaver. Um, I am a Holman resident for a very long time. My Both my children have graduated from Holman, um, as well as my husband and I. Um, we currently live on Bryce Prairie, down in Alaska. Moved there a couple years ago, um, which is still considered the school district. Um, I have been, I'm a graduate of Winona State University with a Bachelor's of Science in Therapeutic Recreation. Um, currently, I'm an employee for La Crosse County at Lakeview Health Center in West Salem. Um, and I act as the Recreational Therapy Manager, and I'm currently a Certified Therapeutic Recreation Specialist at that facility. Um, recently, I've passed a national and state exam for a nursing home administrator license. Um, so I work with people with challenging behaviors, um, the dementia Alzheimer's level, um, and then also people with mental illness. My husband of 25 years works for Reinhardt in La Crosse. Um, our daughter Josie is a student and athlete at UW Eau Claire. Our son Jonah is currently um, the assistant JV wrestling coach um, here in Holman and also attends Western Tech. Um, so all four of us, I do have to say, um, graduated from Holman High School. I'm pretty proud of that and very proud to be in the Holman area. Um, the reason I guess why I'm running for um, school board is I've spent many years um, participating in our children's events or their activities, um, you know, participating in the fundra fundraisers <laughs> and um, and things and you know participating in their sports but now it's it's my opportunity to give back to the community um, this district has you know really done well for you know the four of us um, and oh I just gotta stop <laughs> and um, so it's just our opportunity to give back to the community and the school district so thank you everybody I now have a series of questions some from the audience and some that were um, ahead of time so I will be combining some of them have overlaps and we would be starting with Rick as the first gets this first question. So, what do you think are the major priorities, if you can give me two or three, for the school uh, board to focus on to improve either student achievement or budgeting or other I issues within the district in the next um, one to five years? And now you get one minute um, to answer the questions. <clears throat> So when I first moved to the area 22 years ago, at about year 20, if you count backwards, I was told that the growth in this district was, had a phenomenal potential. Um, there were 900 new homes that were slated to be on the list. Um, I work for a train company, which I, I failed to mention earlier. I'm an engineer, a mechanical engineer. Uh, growth is what a company tries to do. Growth is what a school district tries to manage while maintaining a high level of education and meeting the needs of all. Um, I still see growth as the biggest challenge for the district, managing a large multi-million dollar budget each year and coming up with a, a plan that can satisfy the majority without leaving the minority in the, in the dust um, is a big challenge. I don't think that that challenge has changed in 22 years. So, um, thanks. Lisa? Okay, I think uh, besides the growth, I, I'm excited about the growth, but uh, I also understand that the, the kids, especially at the high school level, uh, you know, they need opportunities. Not everybody can go to a four-year school. Uh, one of the things I've spearheaded at our, at our work is to bring some of the industrial technology students through, let them see what we do. We're a manufacturer of uh, heating equipment, and we let them come through, and they can see how our laser runs, how the CNC runs. Uh, manufacturing has changed since probably the time that their parents were there. So we try to, to allow the students to see other opportunities throughout uh, without going to a four-year school. Um, we also have uh, participated in the Youth Apprenticeship Program, and that's a relatively uh, new one for us that we have uh, a student from the high school in working every afternoon while he's training to be a welder before going off to WTC. Thank you. Thomas? I picked up uh, some old materials that we found laying around the house the other day, and in there was a, uh, a uh, athletic schedule from 1977. And judging from the number, the people that Holman played in football in 1977, uh, there's been phenomenal growth in this district since then. 
if you talk to the people at City Hall here in Holman, they too anticipate that in the next 20 years you won't recognize the village of Holman. So I think growth is probably the thing that probably is gonna be ongoing, the biggest challenge for the district. And uh, that has to be done with a, an educated uh, and statistical uh, support uh, there's been some, there was a movement a few years ago to try to build a new junior high school in, in Holman, and uh, the statistics didn't support it, and so it was defeated. So but I think that needs, that's going to be the challenge for the district. Rebecca. Um, I agree with the majority of everybody up here and in relation to the growth, but I also, um, I think <coughs> it's been an ongoing thing with this district is um, 20 years ago, we've always known that this district is growing, has been growing. Um, so it's a continuing issue. Um, I also, you know, foresee that academics is huge um, in the district. Um, benefits and compensation, I guess, for employees. Um, the building and grounds, um, that's all I have. <laughs> Lisa? I think the priorities that I see are maintaining and building this um, momentum of strong leadership within the district looking at how we can best support the best that we have to keep going and working on all of our um, um, goals that are going to be best for the kids for um, in the classroom um, give the teachers and the support staff the direction and the support they need to do what they need to do in the classrooms and outside the classrooms um, also i think being able to withstand um, the ebb and flows of the political arena, um, which will ultimately affect our, our financial flow and what we'll hopefully be able to do in the future, um, be able to withstand that and kind of maintain what the district has already had with an amazing way of projecting out, um, looking ahead to see um, what we can do, but not overreacting to a forecast of maybe not having much coming forward back or back to us for the budget. And then also um, really tracking closely what we're doing with our referendum dollars. Thank you. Lisa, this one goes to you. It's about open enrollment. The Holman School District loses more students to open enrollment than it brings in. How would you address this issue as a board member? Well, that's a great question. It's one I've, I've thought of um, many times. I, I understand that Holman loses a lot more students uh, than we gain every year. And, um, I would think mostly making sure that our, our teachers are the best prepared so that they can teach the students appropriately and the students can, can perform well on the standardized tests. It's always a, a hard thing to judge, but um, I think that we, we should also try to uh, make sure that each of the, the students is um, ready for the testing regardless of what level they are. Um, I would also, uh, I think, to address to address that type of thing, make sure that there's other opportunities within the district. Uh, so it's not just the test scores, but that the district as a whole is meeting the needs of all the students we have. Thomas? Well, I think the uh, the challenge is, is to continue to operate at a high level. The, uh, you know, there, there are a number of parochial schools that are drawing a lot of kids out of, out of Holman. And uh, if we're gonna keep those kids, we have to be better than those schools and, and, and for those kids that, that aren't going to parochial schools, and there are a bunch of those too, uh, we need to just have our programs be superior and have the incentive for those kids to stay in the district. Uh, whether it's uh, extracurricular activities or whether it's academics, both of those share a, a good position in attracting students into this district and keeping students. Rebecca? Um, if we are losing kids due to open enrollment um, or then coming in, I'd be curious as the reasons why I would be um, actually surveying or asking why we are losing those kids and why kids aren't coming in. Um, is it academics? Is it our um, extracurricular activities that we're not on top of? Um, so I guess my, re my, my curiosity is in the reasons why. Lisa? 
Actually, the open enrollment poses questions for me too, um, and I've learned a little bit about this in that it isn't always that we're doing something wrong. It may have something to do with something entirely different, a sibling factor, um, a convenience factor for a parent close to employment. Um, but I would also want to know those in-depth reasons as to why and how can we convince them to stay? What would, what would convince them to um, want to be here? I think offering diversity and flexibility is definitely something I've heard from parents that they want to be able to um, know that if their child has a need of some sort, whether it's special needs um, or other, that the district would be willing to look into accommodating that need and whatever that might look like. Rick? So regarding open enrollment, not being involved in the board, not being involved in the, the, um, the trends of how that's affected uh, the district, I think the first thing to decide is if it's a problem talked about growth and one way to manage growth is perhaps to allow kids and give them options and that's to some extent what the choice provides and that could be a relief valve to take off the pressure on the growth aspect when the district would be not in a position to, to make that uh, accommodate. But if the district decided that it is in fact a problem, the first thing that you would want to do I think is to find out what's the root cause or causes of that issue and it sounds like you know, that's been going on for a while and it's viewed as a problem and so the first thing would be to understand why and then go ahead and address each one of those as best you can. And this one comes to you first. Um, with limited resources, financial resources, how should the school district prior prioritize the balance among core academic instructions, um, languages, the arts, co-curriculars, that type of thing? Well, it's it's a matter, uh, and I think the board has has uh, a number of policies that they they work from, and it's a matter of doing the priority state uh, search, and you put the money where it's needed. How you do that, I guess it's just a meeting of of, of the minds as to what everybody believes is the is the best place to spend the money. It, I don't th I know if there's any real secrets to it. I know at La Crescent, and, and I don't think any other dis school district uh, has any any magic uh, wand that they can raise to do that. I think all the school districts are facing the same thing, and, and the school districts that are doing it are the best are the ones that are talking about it and coming to a consensus opinion as to where those dollars need to be spent. Rebecca? Um, if, you know, we're living in a restricted in, uh, budget, and we have I think things to consider for the kids is safety um, and making sure our kids are safe. So if there's an item on the on the budget that needs to take priority due to safety, I, I'm a believe, big believer in making sure the kids are safe. Lisa? I think when it comes to limited resources, there's so many things to choose from. And depending on who you ask, you know, each, each item is important. Um, one thing that I've really appreciated about the district is its willingness to get input from community stakeholders to find out what does the community think is important, what do they value, and how can we make um, something work. I also think that pooling resources is something that we've done with, um, you know, sports activities, getting other other schools, other districts involved, and in kind of pooling those resources together. And I thought that was really creative. So I think doing more of those kinds of things to stretch the limited dollars that we have. We, could, we should be doing more of that partnership piece. Rick? Can you repeat the question again? Um, given the limited resources, how should the school district prioritize the balance among core academic instructions, language arts, arts, music, co-curricular? Um, <clears throat> so that's a very difficult uh, question to answer, a uh, dif difficult question to face, but I know the board faces it every meeting. <laughs> so um, what the board needs to do is address the priorities that the board has set out, the mission, the goals for the year, and each time assess those goals and missions, or that, those goals and objectives for the year, um, and decide if those are still the right goals, the right objectives, and can you meet them. And if they can't, uh, what the board's done in the past and done it very well is gone back out for referendum to say we need to stretch. You know, how do you stretch and how do we have to go about stretching 
Um, I've been voted on several referendums in that regard, and I think the board has done a good job at uh, educating the community about the need, you know, about the manner in which it plans to go about that stretching and what the impacts are. I think it's usually pretty clear from a financial standpoint. It's a matter of ensuring that all the stakeholders have been involved in that, uh, um, you know, the intangible decision-making elements to ensure that nobody gets too disgruntled. Rebecca, this one's to you, and there's sort of some of these questions sort of overlap, and so I'm trying to combine them a little bit. So there's a question here about Act 10, which essentially eliminated public unions within the school, and I don't know if it cut drastically funding to public schools, but that's part of the question. And so do you think that some of the recent laws or Act 10 have had an impact upon the district's ability to attract and retain high quality teaching staff? Um, or how do you retain high quality teaching staff? I would have to say yes, Act 10 has affected that. Um, hmm. That's all I can say right now, sorry. Lisa? I think Act 10 has had a huge impact on people wanting to go into the workforce to become teachers. I think that somehow the value is less some in, in, um, with what Act 10 has done. Um, I think in order to retain high quality educators, I think we need to um, make sure that we understand what they need from us to be able to support them. Um, to get feedback from them um, as much as we can and allow for a work environment that um, appreciates them, values them, offers them ongoing education to better themselves, to keep up with all those standards that, are, that keep changing and all being imposed upon them. Um, I think appreciation is a huge retention piece. Rick? Um, but I think Act 10 has had a huge impact on certainly the attitude of the current uh, staffing and faculty uh, that was impacted. I don't know that I disagree with the elements of unionizing, but I certainly disagree in the effects that that, the way it was carried out, um, resulted in poor mm -hmm. engagement, poor um, uh, self-esteem of the educational professionals here in Wisconsin. My brother-in-law was a teacher in Madison, very disgruntled with the way that was carried out. Um, I stood with him and his mother-in-law down at the Capitol in regards to that event as a family member. Um, I disagree with the way it was carried out wholeheartedly in that it separated you know, black from white, saying that this was a big problem. But I think we can recover from that. And that's gonna take an endearing and caring attitude towards our teachers to ensure they understand that they're valued in every aspect. Lisa? When this one is done, and Tom's done, can I go back and answer? Yes, did I skip you? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, regarding Act 10, um, while, while it was restrictive and I think it, it hurt morale quite a bit, um, I think it's given the school district some uh, opportunity to do some different things. They don't have to follow th uh, follow the laws so closely. They, there's other ways that they can retain teachers and, and reward teachers. Um, so while I think he went about it the wrong way and the communication piece was was very poor, um, it, what's come out of it is that people that or that the districts have a little bit of flexibility. You can do some other things to help keep these teachers uh, a, still in the district, keep them here, keep them happy. So. Thomas. The thing I've learned about Act 10, mostly in talking with my daughter who teaches in River Falls, is that the most negative aspect that the teachers in her district have come up, have voiced, is the fact that at this point in time, they don't seem to garner the respect from administration 
because they don't have the voice that they once had. And I think for a district to maintain good staff, it's a matter of keeping the staff an equal partner in the whole process and let them have their voice and let them be part of the process rather than excluding them. And that would be the, the one single thing that I would see would help a, di a, a great deal. Thanks. Apparently I goofed. Lisa, I didn't let you answer the question about limited resources and prioritizing. Is that the one I missed? Yes. 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 Um, I, I especially wanted to answer that Sorry one. about that. <laughs> uh, when we moved up here from central Illinois, um, we came from a, a fairly small district and we had music or the kids had music one day a week and PE two days a week and that was it. Um, they, and they were, had very limited. I, what we found is that they, they took away a lot of those extracurriculars, um, the, the things that make the students a little more well-rounded. Uh, so I was very happy to see when we came up to Holman that that, that was uh, you know, music every other day or every third day. They, they've got it pretty well scheduled out. Uh, but I was excited to see that because I think kids are, are more well-rounded when they get um, the additional. It's always important to have the math, the, uh, the ELA, the science, those types of things that are, that are tested, um, but they need to be able to have some uh, outside interests uh, to become well-rounded people and adults. So. Thanks. Lisa, we're back. Lisa, we're back to you starting over again. Okay. Um, so, question from the audience is, um, do you support or how do you feel about school vouchers? I'm not in support of school vouchers. And I think they definitely break down the public institution of, of education, which I think is something that this country started with to create equal opportunity for all students. And um, I think it, it's draining away at resources um, for our whole community as a whole. So. Rick? I'm not, I'm going to be honest, I'm not too familiar with school vouchers um, and the aspects and the intricacies that go along with planning and, and taking them and, and applying them and what kind of monetary impact it has in the school district. Um, so, uh, you know, what I do understand about them is it's giving some choices, um, allowing some people to move from one area to another. I, I know my parents are very supportive of a parochial school near my house uh, that I grew up at that is benefiting from school vouchers, but I know it's a very contentious issue. Um, so I think a public school system that's fu funded publicly should keep the funds in public pools. I think that's my, my gut reaction to that, but again, I need to get more information about, uh, about the actual impacts of, of vouchers on the district. Lisa? I'm unsure on this particular question. Um, I can see where, I, I myself went to a, a parochial school, so I can see where some parents might want their children uh, to do that. Maybe they think it's a better education. Um, but I, I see the fact that, that the dollars going to the parochial school, um, you know, it's not that much different from the open enrollment. If we have students open enroll out of the Holman district, those dollars that would normally come to Holman are going to the other district as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm unsure. Thomas? Well, I, I think public money should be used for public education and not for other people to carry out their programs. Uh, it's just a pretty simple principle. And uh, those people who wish to send their children to other, other institutions, uh, they need to take care of that ob obligation. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the issue of, of open enrollment and where does it, where does that money come and go? I think I think open enrollment is is more a question of convenience than it is almost anything else, and so uh, we are a bedroom community, and so people go elsewhere for their employment and want to take their kids with them for convenience. So, Rebecca. Um, as far as school vouchers or open enrollment, I guess I look, would look back again and you know ask why, um, why parents would choose to do that. 
um, just research it a little bit. I am not that familiar with school vouchers, um, but I would certainly investigate um, and find out really why these parents are choosing to do that. Rick, this question is to you. Um, a question here. Um, I can make one up. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask what here uh, that somebody else asked me to ask. What have you done to help others unrelated to your line of work or unrelated, well, unrelated to your line of work? Um, give some specific examples as far as a community service type involvement. Um, I'm a volunteer firefighter. I've been a volunteer firefighter in the area for the past 20 years. Um, both the Holman uh, Fire Department as well as now the Farmington Fire Department. We live on the edge of the school district. Um, that's an aspect of, of helping uh, when somebody's not feeling good or is stuck in a car, we help get them out. Um, as far as the community here, uh, my wife and I were leaders of the Long Cooley 4-H, uh, which uh, uh, met um, here in the high school. We were leaders for about four years. Um, I started, helped start first Lego League uh, in the district at a point in time when my son was in, in middle school. Um, we had 30 kids. We took them to regionals up at the Stout uh, about 10 years ago. And then also we've been coaches for the uh, Odyssey of the Mind, um, both for my daughter's team as well as my son's team. So um, not necessarily all altruistic. Uh, usually it involves our kids, but the firefighting, I guess, would be the, the most... Uh, nominal community service that I have done. Thanks. Lisa? I uh, volunteer with the school district a lot. Um, the reality store, the, the program that's run by the high school for juniors, um, that's one of the, the things I've participated in for, for three years, uh, hoping to do it again this year. Uh, the color run, I think that was a fundraiser that, that uh, FCCLA held last year for the first time. and. And uh, I'll be honest, I prefer not to run. I'd, ra I'd rather be one of the, one of the timekeepers or something like that, um, like the festival foods, the turkey trot, those types of things. I, I tend to be one uh, helping to hand things out, uh, shirts or, or the registration packets as opposed to being one of the runners. Um, let's see, tra I have a, a child in track and field and I've had a child in cross country and those always do require a lot of volunteer uh, assistance. So I, I help to keep times or direct the course, whatever it needs to do. Thomas? Well, I guess when our children were younger and growing, we, uh, my wife and I spent a lot of time with our churches that we belonged to, teaching classes with, uh, and mostly high school kids were the kids that we usually grabbed onto and, and had the, the best oppor opportunities with. Since moving to the district, we've been fairly busy just trying to establish our our life here in the district. Recently, I've been uh, participating in the, uh, the the Irish Fest with uh, and in the uh, the uh, St. Patrick's Day parade with my dog and what have you, and to do a little educational things at there at uh, at Irish Fest uh, and what have you. But other than that, not a whole lot of other things. Rebecca? Um, I'm a huge fan of volunteering. I think it's very important that um, raising children, um, that, that the ch the, your children see that, that you volunteer and participate in the community. Um, you know, when my kids were younger, I always participated in the Vacation Bible Schools and the Sunday School Teacher. I traveled on quite a few mission trips with our church. Um, currently, I am involved in the Rotary Lights through La Crosse. This year, I helped with the Thanksgiving dinner um, for the La Crosse community. Um, when the kids were little, um, helped with um, tornado youth hockey extravaganza, raising you know five six thousand dollars for quite a few years. Um, very involved in what my kids were involved with at the time. Um, most recently, um, Jonas wrestling events or by state classic um, volunteering, even though he wasn't involved anymore. So I really believe volunteers are very important. Lisa. Um. I would say personally, I've I've been doing some volunteer work over over a course of 10 or 15 years. Um, not so much recently, but with Big Brothers Big Sisters, I was a big sister um, for about seven years for a young lady. Um, 
I think a lot of the volunteer types, th community things that, that we seem to do, my husband, Shane, and I, and the kids seem to do almost as more informal, um, helping neighbors. We've been um, helping our elderly neighbor that we've known for many years who doesn't have family in the area and has just um, been there for him as, as a family support and friend. Um, also, I think we do kind of informal things like neighborhood pickup, like we take the kids for walks around the block and pick up garbage. Um, so we're not quite as organized yet in all the fundraising, but we, I'm sure we will be. Our kids are six and seven, so we'll be getting involved in that pretty heavy, I'm sure. Lisa, this one's to you. Um, describe your understanding of the school board's role along with or versus the administration role in the district. Okay. Uh, the school board, I think, uh, helps to the uh, administration determine the policies and, and how best to implement those um, or to adjust them, I guess, as needed. Uh, and that includes everything from the, the food service to uh, <coughs> to salaries, to where the money is spent as far as the grounds go. Um, but I think that, that it's definitely a collaboration. However, we, we are, the school board is, is more the manager uh, directing that uh, specifically. Thomas? Over the years as I worked with school districts all over the state of Wisconsin, uh, I got to observe many, many different school boards and how they acted, uh, reacted and how they managed their business. The ones that were the most effective were the ones who stuck to the policy of setting policy. When school boards get involved with trying to be administrators, uh, they don't succeed nearly as well. So I think you know, that's really the, the board's, a school board is the policy setter of the district. Rebecca? Um, I just see the school board and um, administration working hand in hand closely together, establishing policies or budgets um, and communicating that, um, being open to everybody's opinion or their ideas or um, just what they have to say or their educational background as well or their experiences. Lisa? I would say that the administration does so much work behind the scenes, the details, the all the hard stuff and they present us with kind of a final package of here's what it is and when they do it well and they can explain it to us well we're we are typically you know supportive um, if we understand <laughs> and then the data requests come and I'm not going to go into that but um, I think we need administration to help help us to understand things so that we can set good policies so that we can be supportive of um, the actions that are happening, and I, I think the district um, administration does a great job of that, articulating what they do and convincing us that, you know, we're in the right direction. Rick? Um, as far as the school board's concerned and the administration, uh, it's got to be a, a good uh, relationship, first of all. There has to be a lot of talking that goes on outside the boardroom, I believe, to ensure that uh, things are are not just settled in one room. Um, as with any political and or organizational element, uh, there's a lot of soft selling that goes on, so people are fully aware of issues when they arrive at the time that it's their, uh, the time to raise their hand to vote or not vote. But the school board is, I believe, uh, you know, responsible for ensuring that they are uh, representing a good uh, voice to the community, but more so an objective uh, sounding board for the administration. The administration is handling the day-to-day -day activities of running a multi-million dollar district, um, making decisions every day. So they need to stay at a relatively high level and ensure those decisions are directed towards you know, achieving the mission and the goals that the district has set out. Thomas, this question goes to you. Somebody has asked a question about compensation for staff. Um, and I'm not sure if everybody knows how compensation is set in the school district for the different staff. The question is, when, comp when compensating a staff with a wide variety of skills and background, what are the most, cri most important criteria, and here they suggest three, that you would like to determine appropriate, that you would like to use to determine appropriate compensation levels? Well, there's a deep question. 
Uh, well, you know, there's been a lot of, there's always a lot of conversation about that, particularly with, with Act 10, you know, that they tried to say that uh, now we can have some merit uh, pay for teachers when we don't have to abide by the union regulations. Uh, there's some merit to that, to, to merit pay. Uh, uh, and uh, if we talk about trying to maintain staff, that may be one of the elements that has to be considered. Uh, there's, there is up in the River Falls in the uh, border battle going on for teachers up there right now. Teachers are moving out of the district and, by get, and getting paid higher wages across the border and then they're moving back into the district and because there's no unions anymore, they, they can negotiate their salaries. So yeah, there, you know, is merit pay something that, uh, that we need to look at? I don't know. Uh, Rebecca? Um, so I'm looking at, this is obviously my personal opinion. Um, most important criteria would be um, experience, whether it's educational experience um, or historical experience, um, their performance on the job and probably at previous employment. Um, and also I'm a big um, advocate for their willingness to improve or willingness to further themselves or willingness to further their education. Lisa? I would say longevity, um, loyalty and staff, um, education, or willingness to um, better themselves through further training, ingenuity, um, creativity, to think outside the box and be able to reach those students at different levels to engage their learning. Um, and I would say the ability to foster a an environment for learning, whether it's uh, their peers, their cohorts, or uh, parents, and and students in their classroom. Rick, um, <clears throat> I think it's very important to engage the staff and the faculty um, on a regular basis, on an annual basis. Um, I don't know the frequency with which reviews are done in the uh, school district, but certainly that's something that should at least be done annually. And it needs to be done annually, I think, in a way that, uh, and maybe this is already done, again, I'm not, not sure, that clear expectations are set for what they should be doing and what kind of uh, capability they should have for their given job, as well as the grade level at which you expect their job. Not just this job requires this, but at this uh, uh, proficiency level within that job, you should be doing this. And here's the kind of salaries that go along with that. Um, and expectations. I agree with merit pay. I think that that's something that you know brought within the district would be helpful, could be helpful, um, could be very complicated to implement. But going from a union to a non-union state, um, I think there's got to be some metrics put in place as to what they're trying to strive to achieve to reach their goal, whether it be educational goals, financial goals, or whatever. Because it can be a variety of things. It's not just one thing. Lisa. Well, the school district is, is an employer like any other, any public employer. Um, one of the things that we do is an annual review for all of our employees. Um, their, their pay is uh, based on merit, but we also look at the market conditions, and I think the school district is doing an excellent job of that um, as well. You have to see what, what the next district over is paying their employees in order to retain the good ones. Uh, but that, most of our most of my work uh, at LB White is done. We do a lot of the research behind the scenes, um, and then we have evaluations done by the supervisor. The peers are also involved, and I don't. I'm not sure that we do that here. I know in college we always did, but there was uh, student evaluations. And in some ways, that can be bad on a, on a teacher at maybe the higher levels. Um, but I think we need to take that into account as well as to how well the students perform based on, on how they're taught by the teachers. Everybody's now answered that question. Um, Rebecca, you would be the next one, but I'm not gonna give you a question because this is now where we need to start doing our two minute closings and two minutes apiece. And we didn't get to answer all the questions. And I'm not supposed to really tell you what you should say in your closings, but let me tell you what the, some of the questions are. You may have felt that you answered this in the beginning, but some people want to know, why do you think you're best candidate for this position? 
Why do you really want to be um, on the school board? Why are you running for the school board? So I guess if you could, maybe you would address that anyway, but those are some of the questions I didn't get to. Rebecca, you have two minutes for your closing. Okay. Um, I just truly feel that I'm the best candidate at this point um, for the Holman School District just because of my history with Holman. Um, coming back to the district, my husband and I, like I said before, have graduated from Holman High School. Um, we are dedicated. We are staying within the district. Um, our children are raised 95 percent and um, it's you know it's our t opportunity like I said before is to give back to the community um, give back to the district um, the district has done an amazing job um, at educating my our kids um, and I would just like to give that opportunity um, to the district and help them as well Lisa I think I'm the best <laughs> actually and would like to continue to do that um, this next term but seriously um, my kids are in the district I'm living and breathing it I'm out there talking to parents um, I'm, I'm a firm believer in going out and talking to my neighbors about you know how they feel things are going and I want to know um, I think we have to be open to talking to people about how we think we're doing um, and I'm I'm a proponent of constant self-evaluation, and I think that's what the district is doing, and I'm really proud of that, that we're always evaluating ourselves and looking for ways that, that we can improve. Um, I've been very pleased with what I've seen so far um, with the district, and I'm committed, and it's not easy for a parent with a husband who's just got appointed, well, the chief position here in Holman um, with the police department and two little kids and I'm, you know, got a pretty demanding job. You know I'm committed um, to this position because of how much is at stake. I, I, I love it. I love doing this work and I um, have enjoyed being part of the board and working with administration. Rick? So based on the gaps of questions that were wanting to be answered but didn't get to get answered uh, I'm struggling to say which one I should answer first but not that you said I needed the state of that script but uh, why am I running because I miss the district uh, honestly after my kids graduated um, there's a big hole that forms when you're not engaged in the Holman School District there's so much going on um, there's so much really good stuff going on uh, there's so many good people so that's kind of why I both want to be on the school board, is to re-engage, but also to give back. I appreciated the 20 plus years that we've had here. Um, I thought that the school district was good, I was told it was good, and we realized it was good. And I'd like to continue that effort to make it, maintain that level of, of, of goodness. Now you're not gonna want me on the board, because I said goodness, but, uh, <laughs> but also to make it better. Um, so I can't say that I'm the best candidate. That's for you to decide, and I don't know enough about the other candidates to, to understand that at this point. But I can tell you that I'm willing, and I would like to, and I would like to put my all into it, and uh, would like to get the opportunity to, uh, to serve. Lisa? Well, first, both Rebecca and Lisa said they're the best candidate, but they <laughs> forget that there's two candidates, the two best candidates that have been here today. <laughs> Um, part of the reason that I am running um, is because the district is, has done so well for my family. I want to give back to the district um, and also to support the, edu the administration and all the educators that, that we've had throughout the years. Um, I am passionate about, uh, about the district, about my kids learning and growing on to, or going on to be successful adults. And I think the school district has uh, done a great job in helping to shape them into uh, productive human beings. So I want to be sure that, that I remain involved. And if it doesn't work out, uh, you know, I, I have other ways. I still volunteer um, in any opportunity I can. Um, but I am, I am passionate about this district and, and the way that it serves the students, uh, getting them beyond just, you know, the district, we have them just for those 12 years. Uh, there's many years after that and uh, they need to be productive, can't, productive people now, uh, learn a lot of, of new things, be well-rounded, so that they, in the future, they can uh, be successful adults. Thomas? 
Ever since my own education was going on, and there, years thereafter, I've really been a champion of education. And uh, when I ran for the board in the Crescent, there were issues facing the district. Once we got a grasp of the, dis of the problems that were going on in the district, I real soon realized that it's a darn good way to give back to your community. And with the experiences I've had with the La Crescent District and the other boards that I've met with over the years, and what I see happening in this district, and I think there are a lot of great things happening in this district. I just think I have some of the experiences that would make good contribution to this Board of Education. Thank you. I think everybody's had the opportunity to give their closing, and I will turn this back to the chair. Okay, well, a sincere thank you to the candidates for your interest in running. You know, it is a big deal to put your name out there for consideration and out there on the ballot. And while you may not be getting as much attention as those candidates are in a, in a neighboring state this evening, mm -hmm. I just want you to know that it is a big deal, and we as a school board do appreciate your willingness to do that. I want to thank the League of Women Voters for their sponsorship of the forum and the community members in the audience. It's a sure way to get a good um, turnout is by having more candidates than we normally do. Remember, we do have a primary on February 16th, and April 5th is the spring election. Nothing is more important than an education, so please make the time to cast your vote. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.